Thanks, Jeremy. Um, our first speaker for today is uh, Alexei Lisitsa, um, who is telling us about first order theorem proving and disproving um, for reachability problems. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for Jeremy and Rob for invitation for this such an inspirational meeting. And I'm very happy and honored to be here. Uh, the topic of my talk you see now, and before I start, I would like to make some remarks, or maybe disclaimers. disclaimers. Uh, so there will be some formalization in this talk. The formalization would be pretty really simple, I would say straightforward, almost naive formalization of uh, mathematical concepts within first order logic. So formalization here is not a target, formalization here is not a, an issue, formalization here is a tool which allow you uh, combining such formalizations with first order automated reasoning tools get a very powerful and elegant and simple methods for exploring reachability questions in computer science and in <coughs> mathematics uh, as well. So here is a short overview of my talk and uh, the first part would be an application to verification questions and two topics involved, that uh, means that I, I will spend some time and explain some details. All other I will just mention uh, during my, my, my talk. A second part of the talk would be an application for mathematics, specifically to this rather famous conjecture in combinatorial group theory, and we put this conjecture. But I would like to start with some preamble and some uh, puzzle which might be known to you. So I, 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 in fact, am interested to know how widely this puzzle is known. Can you confirm it? All right, so there are uh, quite a few people who know that. Uh, nevertheless, the puzzle is pretty simple. So you see it here. And why at all it's here? Well, first of all, it's illustrate the best, I believe, the method I'm talking about or an approach I'm talking about. And secondly, because the puzzle itself is rather well known and it appeared in a famous book by Douglas Hofstadter, Gerdel Escher Bach, an internal golden braid. Uh, so the puzzle is about some string rewriting system when we have initial string mi. So all strings are, are built from the alphabet m u i, three letters only. And, oh, sorry. So we start in the axiom mi, the initial string, and we have some rules which allow you to uh, modify the strings. So if you have some string, so the first rule, well, I hope it's more or less straightforward. So if you have any string, if we had a i on the right, on the right hand side, then you can add u on the same side. So if you have any string which starts with m, and then anything, you can double this anything. If in any string you see three or threefold i going in a row, you can replace them by u. And if you have a double u, you can throw it away and get a new string. So given this axiom, so given a starting point, starting word <coughs> derivation rules, you can derive some words by using an obvious property. Now the question which constitutes a new puzzle is if mu is a theorem of such a system, whether you can derive a new. And uh, what would be opinion of the audience? Can you derive? No. No. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah, you can derive. Thank you. And of course, it's a rather well known fact. So MU it does not belong to this language. So I use this notation L M I U as a language of all such words derivable in the system. Uh, the condition which has been discussed in the book uh, itself was that uh, the number of symbols i, of i symbols in any string, cannot be multiple of three. So whatever you do, you can get some string with some number of i's, but you never ever get uh, the string with uh, such a number, multiple of three, including zero. Zero has its accepted in mathematics. Also multiple three. 
Now, if you combine this condition with another one, you get a full, uh, sorry, full characterization of all derivable streams. And that is actually published in um, mathematical intelligence if I remember right in 18, 1988. And basically, it says that any theorem should start with M and then follow by an arbitrary word in I and U. And then you combine both conditions, you get exact characterization of all strings derivable in, in here. But now a question, uh, the question I would like to address here, how to solve it automatically. So can you actually propose generic procedure so you can apply to this uh, puzzle and get the answer automatically? And the answer is, let's apply classical uh, for logic. And here is yet another reference to formalization. We will just formalize this puzzle in first order logic and apply standard automated reasoning for first order logic. Uh, well, there are some remarks, because in a way, historically, uh, it, it, it came later after I have applied this method to, to other problems, and then I realized this, uh, this problem also can be solved in this way. So this is so-called finite counter model methods, which I will explain just in a few, few minutes. But first, formalization of this uh, puzzle. First of all, we need to formalize uh, the process of string building. And as you would expect, it naturally comes the theory of monoids. So we have semi-group axiom associativity of concatenation, and we have here, um, axiom, standard axiom for unit. For unit. Now, the rest is, again, I draw your attention, very natural, straightforward formalization of the conditions of this puzzle. So we have a claim that M, MI is a theorem of the system, so you denote it by T of MI. So that is intended meaning is, well, MI is derivable. Now then we have an obvious implication, <coughs> which basically saying if this is derivable, <coughs> then this also should be derivable. Again, as you see, it's just straightforward the formulation of the rules, just in, 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 in terms of uh, first product axiom. Uh, now we have a proposition, and I claim the proposition is also straightforward and uh, <coughs> obvious. The proposition is the following. So if you have any word in this language derivable in the uh, MIU system, then in such defined theory, which I showed on the previous slide, you can derive in a standard first order logic uh, sense, you can derive the statement T of term encoding of this word. The term encoding is just a multiplication of all the letters for which the word is, uh, is built. And it's done, well, the proof is straightforward, you just do it by induction. So any derivation uh, in an original uh, MIU system, you can mimic in the first order logic derivation in such a theory. It's if and only if. Uh, yes, you, you have to be careful about ground and non-ground terms. For ground terms, yes. Okay. If and only if. So you have any, any ground term here. It's a concrete work. Then you, you get a ground term representation of that. Then in that theory, you can derive this statement. You just follow the steps. No, nothing, nothing else. Now, uh, now you can reverse this statement. Now if you show that it's not derivable, then the word doesn't belong to the language. Right? Uh, so, but the fact that something is not derivable can be established by automated tools first order logic, for example, model finders. So you just find the counter model and establish the fact. Can you explain the word ground term and ground term? A ground term means uh, a term which is built just from a constant, constants and functional symbols. There is no uh, variables in there. So basically we are talking about concrete words here, but at least in, a, in, a, in the first part. Right, so if you have concrete word, I make a term out of this, then I make a statement T of this term, 
And then I claim that it's derivable only if, only if the original work was in this way. What's an example of a ground term? I still don't know what these words mean. I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm a base, I'm a beginner. Ground means no variables. No variables. What, what is a ground term? Uh, when was X is not a ground term. A okay. times B times C, or M times U times U. Okay, I see. And I in, in this context. Right, I see. So there are no, no variables. No variables. You have to be uh, careful with any claims about variables, but if you are talking just about letters, uh, uh, ground letters, then you actually get both directions. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. So what is the definition of this LMIU? Is that what you can produce from the MI in the system, or is that a classification of any numerical information? Is it the no, language no. that he can make? Here, here I'm talking LMIU in absolute sense. Whatever you can derive from the original system. So not a classification that you can get any string that is derived uh, from the no, no, no characterization. But of course, because it's known that it's exact characterization, you can say it in this way as well. Sure, but I hope that you <laughs> will prove the characterization of that. Well, proving characterization is an interesting separate topic. I can discuss it a little bit, but yeah. But LMIU is just a set of all words of this system. As simple as that. Okay, so in fact, you can do a little bit more. Uh, Basically, if you try, if you consider non-ground terms, uh, for example, you consider patterns like x times i times y times uh, u, they can also show something useful with the help of first-order reasoning. For example, if you can establish that is in this theory, which, uh, which I showed on the previous slide, you cannot derive there exists x times z. Then, in fact, none of the instances, ground instances of such term, would be a theorem of MIU. So you can do some more generic statements about uh, non derivability That's again an easy consequence of, of general. Uh, now, what we'll do, we'll do exactly that, what is promised. Now I will even switch to, to my theorem disprover, uh, which is Maze 4. <coughs> so here we have maze 4. On the left we have the axioms I've just discussed. Uh, uh, well, the upper part and the bottom part we have a target to prove. Now if I try to run maze 4, we'll try to find a counter model. Basically witnessing that this cannot be derivable, cannot be derived from Side. Now that I do it exactly that, you will see the answer fully, fully automated way. Okay, so there are some delays in my operating system. In fact, this reasoning is very fast as the tool report itself seconds is zero. Well, in fact, it's not zero, it's probably one hundredth of a zero. Zero, zero point seven. So in that time, after this natural formalization, you get some witness that, in fact, this string is not derivable in my, or the statement about this string is not derivable in my axiomatization. That means the string, in fact, is not derivable in the original <coughs> uh, MIU system. So the answer indeed is negative, and it's done in a fully automated way. So as you see, the only insight needed is just to encode it naturally in a first order logic. Right, so let me return back to my slides. Uh, the model of size three is found in less than one hundredth of a second. The property is proof. Uh, of course from some logical perspective it's a okay everything is done. But we would like to know why. So what is the reason uh, behind this uh, and probability statement. So let us look just a little bit on the interpretation itself of this counter model. So what we get here is a three element set, 0, 1, 2. We get an interpretation of this monoid as given by this uh, multiplication table. We have interpretation of constants, i and m are zeros, and u is one. 
And interpretation of critical T is uh, uh, one, two. Uh, so what we have here, the interesting point here, so if you give me uh, any term in this language, say any, uh, representing any word, then get interpretation in this structure. You just multiply uh, all interpretations of constants it's built from, and you get some answer, just one number, zero, one, two. So any term gets interpretation, <coughs> and by construction, we have some invariant property. So whatever string you derive in your system, its interpretation in original system, I mean, its interpretation will fall to this T interpretation, it will be one or two. And now we notice that if you calculate interpretation of target string, MU, you will get zero. This lies outside of the, of the interpretation of one, two. And that if you like a little bit more detailed explanation why you cannot derive MU. But just because that, that if you like, system produced automatically this multiplication table and shown to you how to assign the value, and by construction, this property is invariant of all reachable streams, and then everything done uh, in that simple way. So it's just the same mod 3 proof, right? Yes, uh, in fact, it's the same mod 3 proof. The difference is, okay, well, it, it has it's to just be a to relay. Yes, just, just to relay, but, uh, but there is an interesting point here. Well, it, there are a few, few more interesting points as, as compared with all uh, all reachable and non-reachable strings for original MIU systems. Uh, just a little bit reformulation, uh, conceptualization, what we have seen so far. So once you have this interpretation, this multiplication table, you get the, uh, you can define the following set. LM, a set of strings such that the interpretation will fall into this one, two. And this LM has uh, two important properties. Properties. One is it subsumes all reachable strings, and uh, MU lies outside of this LM. So in a, in a way, LM is a separator. It separates reachable strings and uh, target string about which we uh, ask the question. It's easy to see that in this case, as well as all other cases when such methodology is applied, you get this invariant of this set of strings is a regular language. This follows from a basic characterization of regular languages by inversion of the reasons of uh, free monoids. So if you take algebraic characterization of regular languages, follow immediately, you get a regular language, a regular separator, uh, which separates reachable strings and target strings. Interesting point here is that it's indeed separator. So in a way, LM is not a set of all reachable streams. It's actually over approximation. Why? Why? Uh, well, we can establish here quite easily, MM is also not a theorem, referring back to this earlier characterization. But if you run, if you run it again for MM, similar process, you will get the following counter model. And I, I won't run it. In, in, in life, but it just uh, trust me that so you get this one, and it's also a separator of all reachable strings and MM. But it's pick up on the oddness properties. It's basically separate separate the things based on the fact that we have odd or even number of Fs. So in a way, it's the simplest separator uh, of this specific target string MM. What about uh, if you give it 101 M's? You mean 101? You will get exactly the same. Because 101 is odd. Ah, right. 101. Ah, no, no. no. You will get something else. You will. Uh, well, probably I won't try. <laughs> I now just want to spend hours playing with this. <laughs> yeah, so you probably will try. Well, we can talk after. Okay. Yeah, but in, in a way you, you get, in a way, simplest possible separator uh -huh. to separate all reachable with, with the target string. Uh -huh. uh, 
Uh, well, another point, returning to characterizations, there was a, some question before that. In fact, you can do characterizations of the full reachable, uh, uh, of the full set of all reachable streams in this fashion, but you cannot do it with just one target stream. You actually need more. You need at least, at least three, at least four target streams. So you can put the adjective goal in here, this shouldn't be reachable, this shouldn't be reachable, this shouldn't be reachable. Run the same procedure, and then you will get characterization by a counter model of size 8 on this particular case. Again, it's run very fast. You get it in a matter of a few seconds and in fully automated way. Now, here again, just a reminder of conceptual picture. Uh, what, what we have here, so we have Initial states, we have some de facto reachable states or strings. We have some invariants produced by a counter model finding, and we have a set of light strings or target strings. So when you pick up a different point in the bad set or different sets of points, you will get invariant sets uh, probably different. And in a way, and it depends on the strategy of a <coughs> counter model builder, in most of the case, kind of standard strategy, try to build a counter model of small size and increase the size and try to build it. So in this fashion, you will get simplest possible invariant, at least in terms of a counter model size. We saw this example in terms of odd given. Uh, again, so this can be seen also, this example shown as an application of generic verification methodology based on counter model finding. Well, in fact, it's discussed in the literature, in the verification literature, this puzzle or in this paper, and uh, I <coughs> particularly noticed that it wasn't fully automated proof and it required a good deal of insight. So I, I would claim that in this way, it's much more natural, fully automated, and only insight in first order encoding, which is trivial, is required. Right. What about reachable words? Okay, you can also show it automatically, but the picture is not that transparent. I will probably run it for some reachable word. And reachable word I've chosen, I don't know why, this one. You can check that it did satisfy the whole uh, requirement that L I U I. And if, well, there is no point to find a counter model, so it will run forever until it goes all the courses because it's reachable. But we can try the prover and see how it goes in this case. And our, the prover was able to prove it. And in fact, well, the prover is a reputation based. Effectively, it's assumed that it's not reachable, it's not provable, and then find the link which leads to the contradiction. But the way it's actually looking at it, it's quite transparent, and you can extract the sequence of steps when you're writing out of this proof. I won't do it in the details, I just hope it's clear. So, minus t means you can't do it. Minus t is, it means negation, negation of this right. Because it tries to find a contradiction, yeah. how does it find contradiction? Yeah. Actually, find the path and then contradict to the to the claim that it is possible. Is this a complete proof, or are there, what are these numbers on the left? Are they like a thousand missing steps? No, no, it's just uh, internal numbering of this produced uh, produced clauses. I see. So the, we're looking at a complete proof. Yeah, yes. So it's a complete. So the serum prover is the law of excluded middle. It should be proved. It can be proved in, in theory. Of course, there might be some uh, uh, performance issues, but at least for this simple example, it's proved. <coughs> right. Okay, so that's, in principle, you can do it by a prover as, by automated reasoning as well. And now it's going to the conceptual point. So as many problems in verification can be formulated in terms of reachability within transition systems. And if we do the same trick I've just shown for this puzzle, if you encode uh, transitions in a system of interest, 
Uh, in a way, if you can mimic them by derivation in the first order logic, uh, then you can use this proving to show safety. Safety means non reachability of that space. Or you can use proving to show that something is reachable. But you need some uh, pretty much natural conditions. So every step in, in transition uh, should be modeled as a step in the cross order derivation. And because we have many tools available, theorem provers or model finders, it, uh, you can use them on the shelf and uh, interesting. Uh, well, again, it's a little bit more formal, but again, it's just the same idea that establishing reachability, I would like to equate with the theorem proving, establishing non reachability with the theorem disproving. And in particular case, where finite counter model finding. Uh, okay, so this again, yet another formulation. But now I would like to, uh, to show a little bit more examples, more related to, to the verification, at least some examples taken from, from the literature, and other methods were applied before, uh, before that. Okay, probably I will skip this. For if, if you are interested only in safety and disproving, you don't even need to require implication both sides. If here is first order encoding of states, you need only this implication. Because if you show that this is not provable, then you would show that it's not reachable. You don't even need to prove them here, just one sided implication. You can also have one, uh, I'll say, unary encoding of reachability. Unary it means intended meaning would be a state is reachable. Then you should take care about initial state encoding. Or sometimes it is required to use binary reachability predicate, which would explicitly said uh, that from state from state S you, you, you can reach that state T. So binary predicate. Uh, so that is a very very answer of the methodology. Uh, okay. So just a little bit about origins. Uh, when I was discovered this type of effect, I was very happy and submitted a paper to FM CAD conference in 2010. And then was told, okay, that everything is interesting, interesting, but it's already been done. Well, at least this, this paper has to be mentioned. But what is interesting in this context, people applied such a like methods only in a constant of in a context of security protocol. For whatever reason, for historical reasons, I don't know. But that was indeed, and I, I would specifically highlight the paper by Selinger. This is five or six pages, very uh, transparent, and discuss uh, this type of things, but in the context of uh, cryptographic protocol, security protocol. Now, since then, of course, I, I, I was a little bit uh, discouraged by that. Uh, but then I discovered that, in fact, the method is much more universal. And you can apply it to the various classes of systems. And at least I listed here some classes of systems. And what is more, you can show the method is relatively complete with respect to, I would say, almost any known methods which use regular invariants. So the mere existence of regular invariants in, in some of the methods mentioned here means that you can reformulate the problems and you can apply first order disproving instead. So that is the idea of relative completeness of such methods. And, uh, uh, then, probably, uh, I, I will skip the de detailed presentation of a particular example, which is an interesting example on its own, interesting because it was applied to the parameterized systems. And then I would like to, uh, to make reference to one of the yesterday talks and some discussions, how we verify the systems for which we don't know, uh, say, size of the system, don't know number of participants, as there is a lot of work in this parameterized verification area. Of course, everything uh, is undecidable in general settings, but there are many decidable classes. 
what is turned out this type of methods based on a uh, disproving uh, could be used instead of almost anything else known uh, in the area. And here is a, one particular example which describes the evolution of array of a finite state machines. An evolution, uh, it follows according to these rules. So you can pick up any finite state machine in this array and make a transition. An opportunity to make a transition depends on the context. In which states are automata to the left, and which states are automata to the right. Uh, here there are some rules. Uh, first means if, if you take, uh, if you are in a green state, or if automata in a green state, and everything to the left and the right are either in green or black state, then this automaton is allowed to make a transition to black. And similarly for all other uh, rules. Some rules without any constraints, you can apply them non-deterministically to any automaton at any point of time. Now the problem is if you have an array of such automatons starting from all in green state, you apply these rules, and the problem is to show that you never ever get a such state that we have two automata in red state. So it's a mutual exclusion protocol, formalization of a mutual exclusion protocol. Uh, my claim is you can do it naturally in the same style as MIU puzzle. Uh, there are some uh, formalization. I won't go into details. I may, may discuss it separately if there is an interest. And again, we just to show that you will never ever get there, you prove from this natural uh, axiomatization but you disprove rather than there exists x, y, and z, such that indeed two reds occur in, in this string. And again, you get a uh, very fast decision, fraction of a second, counter model of size O. Uh, okay, so. And again, we have the same story concerning invariants. Uh, the counter model can actually see in as a representation of a separator, you separate all reachable states and, uh, and all uh, bad states. This is associative? Yes. <laughs> yes, it's associative. And moreover, if you look in more details to this particular table, you can discover how it highlights the fact that two A's are not possible. Because if you have two A's, you have interpretation uh, which give you two reds. Okay, so two times two gives three. Once you get three, no matter what you multiply it by, you always get three. So three is a bad state, according to, to this time table, but to this uh, multiplication table. Okay, so there is some relative completeness theorem. So you can show by monotonic abstraction method, a method which was introduced in the paper I cited at the beginning, then it can be demonstrated by this method too. And the proof relied just on existence <coughs> of regular invariants sufficient to separate uh, all such cases. Uh, again, I will skip some further details just to have a chance to say something about applications to mathematics. Now there are some Three, well, at least three theorems about relative completeness, basically saying whatever you can do it in this post order disproving way. Uh, no, any of these methods, which are classical and known in the literature on parameterized verification, you can uh, recast everything in this style and you can get very efficient verification methods just by disproving. Uh, just existence of regular sets is a crucial point here, regular separators. Uh, of course, when there are no regular invariants or regular separators, then this method will fail. And here is a simple example. And here I would like to make a, a challenge to extend this method for infinite counter models. Because sometimes finite counter models are not enough, as we know all in first order logic. Some theories have only infinite models. That's the reason for that uh, refutable, refutable statements 
are not recursively enumerable in general. So it is difficult, but if you would be able to at least to, to do some approximations to generate some infinite control models, this method would be even more powerful. Right, so let me go in the remaining five minutes just on applications to mathematics and then one particular problem related to groups of combinatorial, the problem in combinatorial uh, group theory. Uh, so we can see the groups and we can see the presentation of groups, presentations of groups given by generators and relators. And relators are effectively words in group alphabet and all such presentation define a group whose elements are words taken up to equivalence defined by equality of all these words to the unit. So that's a kind of standard definition of a group presentation. Uh, and this particular conjecture I would like to address here, you can, uh, we consider only trivial group presentations. And here a trivial example of a trivial group presentation is here, uh, basically saying if A, B is, is a unit, and B is a unit, that A is a unit. So all is um, trivial. Well, this is not so trivial example, but also can be shown in an automated way, if you wish, but also a non-trivial example of trivial group of presentation. Uh, now there are some transformations you can do over group presentations, not changing group itself. And this transformation is just you replace some of the uh, relators by the inverse. You can take any relator replaced by its product with some other relator, and you can conjugate any relator by any word in the, uh, in the generator. Uh, this wouldn't change the group. But the question is, if you have a presentation of a trivial group, and if it's balanced, meaning number of generators and number of relators is the same, then you can show its triviality just by application of this rules I've shown on the previous page and reduce it to this presentation. And this presentation is obviously a trivial group because we require that all generators directly uh, equal to uh, <coughs> unit. So here is a, some transformation. And now to cut the long story short, probably not, not to go too much over time, what happens here? We apply the same idea. We have some object, object to rewrite, so we formulate a theory such that rewriting in this style would correspond to first order derivations, and then apply theorem provers. Uh, so in this way, you will get some simplifications. Okay, why it's interesting, uh, this conjecture? Because it's still open and suspected by many experts that it's not uh, true, it may well be false. And here is specifically intriguing an example, a presentation of a trivial group, it, for which is unknown, it's not known how to reduce it to a trivial one by using the rules uh, I've just shown. Uh, there are many methods try to disprove such potential counterexamples. Uh, here's a list of all methods. Uh, uh, our claim is here. So instead of applying specialized methods, you can apply generic serial proving. You reformulate this problem directly in first order terms and uh, apply generic first order proof. And uh, probably I will skip the rest. I will just show simplification which obtained in this way, which was new and which was, well, okay, so here is a sum of the uh, trivial group presentations for which simplifications, Andrew's Curtis style was, 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 wasn't known. And it was shown the first by this first order theorem proving, just applying the prover to find the path. And interesting here is this groups with three and four generators. Because before that, in all experimental methods, algorithmic simplification finding uh, dimension three and four was considered as too complicated. Dimension two is already very complex. So it wasn't considered in, in the best case was shown our methods go and run forever, not returning in weeks. 
While here, encoding in the first order prover, you can get simplifications in under two minutes of all these examples, size three and four, well, and two, also some new examples. And just to, for you to appreciate the complexity of the result, so here is a last thing uh, I'd like to show, uh, is a simplification which follows the rules. We start with this presentation, we follow all the steps, and arrive to the trivial presentation ABC, applying only our zeros. Well, fully automated way, and under two minutes, probably even faster. I have a table, it doesn't matter. Now, coming to the end, I would say the following thing. Formalization of reachability is in first order logic as a simple and powerful method. This proving can be used to show safety for many interesting problems in parameterized verification. Proving can be used to find that passes in complex domain. And formalization in first order plus automated reasoning can be competitive as compared to specialized algorithms. Thank you for your attention. We have time for a few questions. So you're, my understanding is this last part, you're giving examples of Andrew's Curtis being true. You have presentations of the trivial group yes. that you can prove. Yes, yes. But people believe the conjecture is false. Yes. And these methods are never going to disprove it, right? Ah, this is a point I skipped due to time limitation, but here is something to say about this point. Uh, we cannot disprove it by finite counter models. Uh -huh. It is known fact. So if you are able to disprove it, the counter model should be infinite. Probably so this, this base for prover nine stuff only finds finite counter models. Yes, it? I see. That's just by construction. Uh -huh. So if you would be able to propose some infinite counter model builder, <coughs> at least incomplete, well, ah. then maybe it would be a chance. Oh, I see. So this is a problem for the computer science. <laughs> <laughs> Off you go. <laughs> As I have Jeremy. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm interested in this fact uh, that, that, that um, well, so two questions. So one technical question is, are there any model <coughs> techniques that can find infinite by, by some encoding infinite counter models? And, and then the second question is, so you've given one example where finite models are enough and one example where it's known that finite models are enough. Can you say more about when you should expect or do you have any, is there any theory or any sense of when? When, when you should expect it, that there might be finite models. Okay, so let me start from the second question. So uh, when we are talking about some kind of well-structured domains, in a way like strings or trees, the main factor which contributes is presence of regular separators. If your problem is lucky enough to have such a separator, then you will find a counter model. But reg regular sets which separate reachable sets from your target. So regularity is a key point. And what was your, your first question? Are, are there any uh, tools out there that, will, that can find infinite counter models? Well, and yes and no. In the case <laughs> of the... Sorry, that's, a, that's an evasive answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so in a way, of course, there are many first order serum provers have some procedures based, for example, on the saturation, which kind of implicitly complete the work and implicitly they, they, they tell you there is an infinite counter model. But you need kind of separate procedure how to extract it and what does it mean for it. Another perspective is to encode infinite model building within finite model building using again concept of regular regular model theory, if you like. So in a way, you, you rather would look for finite models, which would be finite representations of infinite models. And it is possible, there is a paper by Peltier, he's 10 years old, I, I don't know about implementation, I actually have some students, I would like to work on this implementation, just take Peltier approach like that, and try to Yes, 
there, there are some examples. And uh, well, kind of general statement is whenever you have well described objects for which you can describe some uh, rewriting or transitions such that you can locally describe them in first order way, then you, in principle, you can apply this. Now, one attempt I've made very recently, not very successful so far, because it challenged automated tools, is so-called free modes, if not not theory. So, if you consider now rewriting on the Gauss words, and you encode natural mod, mod transformations as a rewriting of a Gauss words, so you can reformulate some problems on so-called free modes in this style, and you can even have a chance to succeed. But the problem is now it hits performance issue. So even the finite counter model exists, it takes too long time to find it. So there are people doing finite state order. There are a number of theorists that do end up trying to answer questions with the theory of finite state order. I wonder whether there are if you do yeah. if you do transcendence theory in capture six P then you can start looking for patterns in the theory of the phase P expansion. That's a similar problem. Okay. Well, let's thank Alex again.